our next speaker, which is Nancy Milton. She will come up and I think we will just let Nancy uh, monitor and share her screen. So I will stop sharing. And just in case any of you don't know who Nancy is, she is um, the SANT Chair of Marine Science Emerita at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. She's a member of the US National Academy of Sciences and the most recent recipient of the International Coral Reef Society's Darwin Medal and author of Citizens of the Sea. She is the co-founder of Ocean Optimism and the Smithsonian's Earth Optimism Summits. You can follow her efforts to shine a spotlight on what's working on Twitter at C Citizens. So thank you, Nancy. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay, thanks. <laughs> Sorry, just want to make sure. Um, um, Nancy, I'm so, not hearing you. Um, good morning to everyone. Um, we've got... Okay. Melanie, I think you need to turn on or off the unmute original audio. In the interpretation. Uh, in the, in the interpretation. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think she she can't hear. Uh, you can't hear me at all. Yeah, <laughs> or any of us, I think. And yeah, I can we hear. Can hear I can hear you. I can hear. It's okay. Yeah. And we okay. can hear you. You can hear me. Yes, yeah, yeah. we can. We <laughs> hear you perfectly. It's just me. Okay. So I'm gonna start. <laughs> I I unmuted. I took off the interpretation. So yeah, like, exactly. If anybody else on that had it set to English interpretation has a problem, that shouldn't happen. But there's a glitch. So just turn off your interpretation when an English speaker comes. That should be automatic. But anyway, not a big problem. Thank you. Sorry. All right. So you can hear me. Excellent. Uh, good morning. And uh, we want to see us. It's really a pleasure to be here um, and uh, share with you a little bit of my history of how I am more optimistic despite the cascade of fast, bad news, which sometimes never seems to stop. So um, let me start off by saying that I'm 72 years old and my entire career has been spent uh, dealing with uh, bad news about Caribbean coral reefs. Um, I did my PhD on the north coast of Jamaica. Uh, so it's not part of the Mesoamerican reef, but it is certainly very similar in many ways in terms of the problems it faces and also the species that it can it contains. And the picture on the left was one I took um, just as a beginning graduate student in 1975. And as you can see back then, the reef was covered with living coral, lots and lots of staghorn coral, plus other corals. And uh, and we considered these reefs very healthy, even though you can tell from this picture. Uh, that in fact there were problems, uh, namely there are almost there are essentially no big fish in this picture at all. There's some tiny chromis up in the upper right hand corner, but basically big fish are absent. Now back in 1975, we didn't realize uh, there was a strong connection between the health of the corals and the health of the fish committee. And so I have to say we back then we basically took those reefs for granted. Um, that was a huge mistake because 10 years later, as you can see from the photo on the right, uh, the reefs became covered with seaweed macroalgae and uh, and the reefs in Jamaica remain in, in very, very bad condition. So um, as a result, uh, my husband, Jeremy Jackson, and I spent literally decades talking about uh, the state of coral reefs as the reefs in Jamaica became more and more not they they remained in terrible shape, but more and more reefs started looking like the reefs in Jamaica. And uh, we we would give lectures all around the world, and um, and they were so depressing. I have to say that we became known as Dr. Stoom and Gloom on the lecture circuit. A artist uh, came across one of my talks and took my picture and and acidified it uh, using a, some kind of program. And then my husband's talk, "How We Wreck the Ocean," has been viewed well over a million times. It's sort of your epitome of a, of a doom and gloom presentation. Now, 
those problems haven't gone away and, and in many senses they've gotten worse even in some cases much worse but one of the things i learned over the course of uh, my career is that if all you talk about is are the problems this can lead to apathy not action um, this I think captured really nicely in this cartoon from the New Yorker magazine where a guy sits on the couch talking to his friend and he says making a difference doesn't make a difference and sometimes it can feel like that I, I acknowledge that it can be really hard to uh, get up and continue to feel like you're having any effect at all when the when the news uh, keeps hitting you uh, in a hard way uh, but one of the so so in as I say, I, I became aware that um, that this doom and gloom strategy really wasn't working. Actually, talking and teaching students at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, um, and uh, one of the things I realized was that these students uh, really need to know. They didn't want to just know about the problems. We we were trying to do more. That they wanted more than a training on how to write the obituary of the planet. And they really wanted to know what they could do to make a difference. And so that was uh, back in about 2009. I started thinking about how to take that doom and gloom messaging and uh, and turn it into something that was more empowering. And that's where the beginning of uh, hashtag ocean optimism came from. It actually was preceded by a series of seminars called um, Beyond the Obituary Success Stories in Ocean Conservation. And um, and then even has more recently at the Smithsonian led to the Earth Optimism Summits uh, beginning in 2017. So what is this whole, what does it mean to, uh, to sort of think about the hashtag ocean optimism? Basically, it's not a question of putting on rose colored glasses and sort of ignoring the bad news. It's, it's, it's about where you where you put your emphasis and how to acknowledge the bad news but at the same time celebrate and learn from the good news and i think this is really captured in a in a um in a, a report that jeremy jackson wrote in 2014 which i'm sure you're all aware of uh assessing the status of the caribbean reefs and the way this report is structured as you see it here there are, he illustrates how some reefs uh, collapsed early on um, some reefs had kind of a steady climb, but there were uh, reefs that had really stayed in reasonably decent shape, not perfect shape by a long shot, but, but had not collapsed uh, ecologically. And so the, what the report tries to do is understand, you know, why these so-called bright spots occur. And if you search on, if you search on Google Scholar for bright spots, you'll see that it's a whole, for, it's a whole way of uh, analyzing data to look for the successes and uh, learn from them. That's really the essence of ocean optimism. It's not some kind of ignore all the bad news uh, approach, but rather uh, just not get mired in the bad news and become paralyzed by it. And so I thought today what I would do is just share a few examples of success stories that I think are really interesting um, in terms of informing what to do about reefs. The first has to do with uh, uh, the, the reefs of Bonaire. Uh, not too far from the Mesoamerican um, Barrier Reef. Uh, and this is a study by Bob Stenick. Uh, and, um, and what he showed uh, was that the, first of all, that the reefs in Bonaire were uncharacteristically dominated still by coral, even in uh, 2017. And so what you see on the screen is that this is macroalgae on the, on the horizontal axis and coral, percent coral cover on the vertical axis. And this is what the reefs look like throughout the Caribbean, including Jamaica when I first started to study them, with relatively high coral cover on average and low macroaquaculture uh, coverage. But since then, we've had a, a throughout much of the Caribbean, uh, a drop in coral cover and an increase in macroalgae. But Bonaire is an exception. Um, and so what he wanted is because here you see Bonaire is up here above the average Caribbean average in terms of coral cover and well below it in terms of macroalgal cover. So um, what's I think really interesting about um, Bob Stenick's study is what it says about the resilience because it's not as if uh, Bonaire's reefs haven't had to deal with bad uh, bad events and in particular in 2008 
there was a hurricane and in 2010 there was a big bleaching event. So here you see the amount of algae which was low initially and then of course it jumped up following the hurricane and the bleaching event. But since then it has again declined uh, to much healthier levels. And similarly for corals, uh, the hurricane and the bleaching event resulted in a drop in coral cover, but then a su subsequent rebound. This is really the essence of resilience, the ability to back, back, uh, bounce back from uh, uh, um, uh, sort of damaging events. And I think it's interesting to think about what Bonaire did in this context. So there's a whole list here of steps that had, were taken starting in 1971 with the banning of spearfishing, then 1975, the banning of the live harvest of corals, the establishment of the National Park in, in 1979, uh, the first surveys in 1999, regular monitoring starts in 2003, and in 2010, um, uh, fishing for parrotfish was banned and the fish traps were phased out. So you can see that this is a long process, beginning in 1971 and continuing to this day. So that's 50 years of work uh, to uh, make sure that the reefs of Bonaire are re reasonably healthy. Um, and then the other thing I would like to note is a, a, a recent global analysis of the relationship uh, between various aspects of reef health and the mortality during a bleaching event. So the data from Bonaire is really about resilience, in other words, the corals, the coral cover declined as a function of heating, um, but then bounced back. What's interesting about this study and really surprising, I think, to a lot of scientists was that there was a relationship between several attributes of coral reef health and the actual mortality caused by the bleaching, not the bouncing back, but the mortality. And you see here a graph from this study uh, by Donovan um, and colleagues in science. And what you see is that um, this is the amount of macroalgal cover, and this is the change in coral cover. So anything you know, go down here is bad. And uh, what you can see is that um, as you get the the more coral, the more the more seaweeds there are. Um, do, this is a sort of mild bleaching events, and these are severe bleaching events in orange. But regardless, the the more macroalgal cover you have the bigger the decline in coral cover immediately following a bleaching event. And really remarkably, I think, is the effect is stronger with stronger bleaching events. And so I think this is also a really important piece of information um, to uh, support the need to make sure that coral cover is not, not being compromised by too much seaweed. And then finally, I'd like to say a little bit about the recovery of NASA groupers in the Cayman Islands. Um, it's, um, this was a paper published in 2020 in PNAS. And what you can see is that both on Little Cayman and Cayman Brac, um, you have, at the, after a number of years of very, very low levels of uh, numbers of fish um, and spawning aggregations, what you see is an uptick during the last couple of years. And uh, on the left, you can see videos from these spawning aggregations in, in the Cayman Islands. And I think um, what's, again, what's really interesting um, is, um, is thinking about what it was that the Cayman Islands did. So back in the 1980s, the fishers started to raise concerns about lower catches. MPAs were established in 1986, but only covered 14% of the coastline. They began monitoring in the late 1980s. Uh, but in the 1990s, spawning aggregations collapsed. They, in 1995, they recommended uh, alternate year fishing on spawning aggregation, but it wasn't implemented because there wasn't enough support. And then um, 1998, these spawning aggregation sites were designated as restricted. 2003, a complete ban on fishing. Then between 2007 and 11, a series of laws which uh, changed the bans to from November to March, which is the spawning season, and also limiting catches to 12 fish daily. 2006, uh, no take, no possession, and no sale of Nassau groupers uh, between November and April, and a five fish limit. And then in 2019, the MPAs were expanded to 45% of the coastline. So again, just as with the Bonaire um, example, I think it's really worth recognizing that this kind of work takes time. Um, and uh, sometimes, you know, there's there are things that go well and things that go badly. And it's just really the persistence and the single-mindedness of purpose that ultimately results in success.
And so I think in that kind of context, that's really important thinking about how you tell your story. I know last year you had some very good news, but also some disappointing news. And there's sort of two ways of thinking about it. Um, and I put these both in the what's called the ABT structure and button therefore, which is a kind of narrative tool to help you tell a compelling story pioneered by Randy Olson. So a, and the idea here is that you start with agreement in the and part, and then you in, introduce some contradiction uh, to build narrative tension with the but, and then you wrap up the story with a therefore. Um, but, there, but how you construct your and button therefore uh, narrative uh, can vary a lot. So one way of looking at bad news to say we, we worked hard and we had some important successes, but we didn't do enough, therefore things got worse. Now that's certainly one way of putting together the story, but as you can see it ends on sort of a down note, a kind of paralyzing note. Um, and then the alternative is say to start in the same point of agreement, we worked hard and we had some important successes, but not all the news was good, so acknowledge the issues. Therefore, we need to do more, but also remember that things would have been much worse without the efforts that we made. And so taking it in sort of an empowering structure rather than a, a structure that tends to lead to paralysis. And so um, I'd like to close with a bit of big news. I'm a member of the global board of the Nature Conservancy. And uh, they just concluded in November the world's biggest blue bond deal uh, worth $180 million, tripling the conservation uh, marine conservation budget of the country through a restructuring of the debt. Now, this is obviously good news for Belize, but I think any, good news in any part of the uh, Mesoamerican reef is good news for all of the reef because the reef is, of course, one great system and it's very interconnected. And so with that, I'll close and uh, take any questions.